place our hearts in the palm of your hands, Father. We place our mind, Father, in the palm of your hands, Father. And Father, according to the instructions that you spoke and the promises that you gave, you promised that the day would come when you would make a new covenant. And this new covenant would not be like the old covenant you made with the people of Israel when you took them by the hand out of Egypt and you gave them your instructions. But this is a new covenant where you have promised that you will write, you will engrave your instructions in our minds and in our hearts, oh God. <clears throat> and Father, I believe that for 2,000 years your promise has been yes and amen, but for some funny reason, a lot of the shepherds that were called to teach did not know about the blessings of your instruction. And so they told the people that there are no more instructions of God because that's all the old. And they threw it out and they're wondering, what is it? What is it that you're trying to write in our minds and in our hearts when we've thrown everything away? And so, Father, on their behalf, we repent and we take the whole, the whole word from Genesis to Revelation, Father. And Father, with Yeshua, Father God, we say, we declare, that you have not sent Messiah to abolish your word, but to fulfill it, Father God. To fill it full, to completely fill it, Father God. And so, Father God, we are these little broken vessels, Father God, that come before you tonight and we say, fill us Full. Fill us full, Adonai. Fill us full. Thank you, Father. Father, I thank you that we're not here to receive information because information is just that which makes us think that we actually are pretty smart. I thank you, Father, that we can just lay here and we could sleep for all you care. Because what you're about to place in us is the fulfillment of your spirit, the fulfillment of your promises, Father. And we praise you, and we bless you. And may these words, Father, may these things that we hear tonight, Father, be used for your glory. That the world may see the unity of your people, where they're willing to give their life for one another, Father God where they're willing and, 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 and able to boldly go and forgive their enemies, Father God. For that is what will bring the salvation to a lost world, Father. Not when they see the pointing finger of correction, but when they see the open hands. When they see open hands with nails on them. And they see, and they see, and they hear the voice of one who cries out and says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. Thank you, Father. Change our minds. Change our thinking. Change even our ability to receive information, Father God. Father, we pray that this evening, this information will not come the way we process information in school. Because in school, it is necessary for us to memorize information to go and pass the test. And we thank you, Father, because this is not a situation in which we need to memorize information to pass a test. Because the test has already been passed. And it was passed by the King of Glory. So we get to come and enjoy being filled with spirit, with things that are not understood by men, things that are not understood by doctors, things that are not understood in Bible school. So that we can be filled, complete, lacking nothing. Father, you created us to be vessels lacking nothing. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. And it 
is, it is from that place, Father, from that place of perfect security in the Lamb that we sit here the same way that your people sat on the hill and listened to the one and the only yes. rabbi speak. <laughs> the rabbi of all rabbis. The pastor of all pastors. Yes. The king of all kings. Yes. The priest of all priests. Lord of all lords. Thank you, Father. Anything else is a waste of our time. And time is a luxury that we no longer have. Thank you, Father. 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 I want to encourage you, servants of the living God. I want to encourage you by the things that you are to hear this evening, I want to encourage you because you are not in school. There is no test at the end. I remember years ago when I and I returned back to my Hebraic roots, I drove myself crazy. Because I, I, I got access to some of these amazing mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. And I said, oh my God, I'm so old. I'm like 30 some years old now. I am so old. How will I ever learn these things? And I remember going to my rabbi and saying, rabbi, I don't know what to do. I'm too old. I'm 30 something. I remember my rabbi said, Dear, you don't have to learn any of this. Just walk it. Just walk it. As you walk it, it becomes part of you as you become part of it. But in my humanness, that wasn't enough. I had to learn. You know what it is? You're like, but I can't. serving the Lord for many years. How about I burned? Some of us have spent money in school. I would have spent a lot of money in school. My head just didn't work well in school, so they sort of got rid of me. It became clear to everyone involved that this whole school thing was not going to work out. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a blessing when you learn that the first year, and then you only spend one year of tuition. <laughs> and, then, and then you spend like the next 12 years paying for it. <laughs> I, I, I found out the hard way. You know the thing that you signed that says, you know, once I graduate, I have six months before I start paying my tuition. Oh, Baruch Hashem, once I graduate six months, oh, I'll be a smart person. I'll have a good job at least in a few months. I didn't realize, no, no, it's not when you graduate. When you leave school. So a year after I got kicked out, <laughs> I realized I had defaulted on my loans <laughs> and spent the next 12 years paying for a loan. Oh, I didn't I? But this is the difference between what happens in our human mind, the way humans think, and the way Adonai wants to awaken us to truth. He said, I will write these things in your heart. I will place these things in your mind. And that is very encouraging. You know why? Because you could be sitting here and you in your head might hear these things for the first time. But something inside of you will begin to leap. Something will begin to leap because something within you will say, that's right. I already know that. 
And the one inside of you leaping is the spirit of the living God who understands this better than any of us could ever begin to understand with our human minds. It is the very spirit of the creator who placed the moon in the heavens, who set the moon for the seasons, who, who knows when, when the crops will grow, who knows how to plant, who knows the mission. He can look at a million seeds and looking at one, he knows exactly what that seed is even though to us they all look a lot the same, the same. That one, the God, the one, the, the great, the greatest, great, great spirit of the universe, our Father, our King, the one that died on the cross, the one who loves us so much that he saw how the world was about to be doomed because of its own destruction, the one who saw that and said, I have fallen in love with this creation and I will give my life to restore it back to me. That one inside of you, when he begins to hear the mysteries of the kingdom, that one begins to leap in your heart. And oftentimes what happens is our intellect, our brain, tends to get in the way. Because we're trying to understand it. Oh, okay, I gotta memorize this. I gotta memorize this. Then you come in and you start taking notes. Okay, what is that? It used to look like my dog Al. People said, now it's looking more like a lamb. <laughs> yes, it's a lamb. <laughs> and you take down notes because you've got to go home and you've got to look at this. Listen, I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm not against taking notes. I'm not. I'm simply telling you. There are notes written in your heart greater than you will ever be able to write down. I get myself in trouble for saying this, but I say it anyway because you know what, I might as well just go all the way. This written word, Adonai, has written the spirit behind this word. And it's clearer and greater what he's written in your heart than your ability to understand their actual written word. If you read it day after day after day after day after day, you could memorize this word for word. And if you don't have the spirit writing the, the spirit of the word in your heart, it is worth nothing. This is why I get very frustrated when people come and they come from schools of thought where they've been told King James only and B -B -B only and 18th century only. Nonsense. Nonsense. The understanding of the word of God comes by the spirit of God that he has promised. I have promised you I will send you my spirit. And my spirit will lead you into truth. How do you know that? It's like a mystery. Yeshua says, where I'm going, you cannot go. And then he left to go to the Father's house. The Father's house is in you. You are the rooms that are being prepared. You are the rooms in the Father's house that are being prepared. The spirit, how do you know the spirit is about truth? Because the spirit is him in spirit and he is the truth and he is in you. Singing and dancing. Expressing, expressing the fullness of the glory of the Father in you. Calling you to become one as he <coughs> and you are one. The Father in him him and you until the day that when people look at your eyes they will see the Son of God. And if they're seeing the Son of God, they're seeing the Father Himself. And this is the thing that the religious will kill you for because it sounds like blasphemy. Oh no, no it's not blasphemy. I'm not saying you are a God. I'm saying you are one part of, completely connected to Him as one, not a God, to God. 
and all of creation is longing to see the manifestation of the sons of God. It's a spiritual son. You have to understand that there are male and female in the natural. <laughs> That's just because you have a role that I called you into this world to manifest that particular role. It has nothing to do with male or female. When the scripture says that he's looking for the sons of God, he's talking about a spiritual, spiritual son. It's that thing leaping inside of you. All this nonsense, well, women are not supposed to speak. Just, come on. To see, that's what happens when you interpret scripture with your own head. Instead of interpreting it via the spirit of God. Thank you, Father. Okay, this is extremely exciting for me because the scripture says that those who keep Torah and teach others about the blessings of Torah will be great in the kingdom of heaven. Those who do not teach and teach others not to, they'll be least in the kingdom of heaven. So it's a great thing to be in front of a royal priesthood because this is what you are. And the words that you hear and the things that you see simply activate the spirit of the king of glory in you, the priest and king. And it gets activated so that at a certain point, our Father can place you in a different place of this whole earth where his glory needs to be manifest. And the Spirit of God within you begins to express the things of the kingdom, teaching the nations how to celebrate the festivals of God. Teaching the nations how to understand God's calendar. Teaching the nations what to do at which time of the year. Preparing the nations for the king who is coming. The amazing thing about this king that is coming, he didn't get voted in. He did not get voted in. He did not say <coughs> this and say, can you all just look it over and see what she can like pass as legislation? We need some votes. Get the elders together. We got to vote on this. I'm not sure if I put, should put Samuel in here. Oh no. <laughs> oh no. Until heaven and earth pass away. Matter of fact, I believe it says heaven and earth will pass away. But, my word, will never pass away. Adonai is raising up a royal priesthood. And they can take every single one of these books and have a bonfire with them. But no one can erase the Spirit of God that is the flame within you. So you want to understand bonfire? Oh, I get it. There's a fire in here. You can't burn this thing. It's already on fire. He didn't say, on that day, I'm going to help you memorize the book. He said, on that day, I'm going to write and scribe on your heart. You'll be my God. We'll be your people. Um, I like visuals. Um, One day, um, a rabbi came up to Yeshua, and the rabbi said to him, um, Master, what is the greatest commandment? And Yeshua said, you know, we're familiar with that, you know, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength. And then he said, oh, and, and the second one is just as important. Your neighbor 
as yourself. The rabbi walked away and says, okay, it's a good answer. For those of us who have been raised in a, in, in a church environment, we read that and we say, oh, nice story. Yeshua punched another rabbi in the nose because he's so cool. But if you read that from a Hebraic mindset, you realize, hmm, there's more to this story than meets the eye. You see, what Yeshua was quoting, quoting when he said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, was the end of a commandment that is the greatest commandment. He was quoting the last half. So a Jew reading that says, wait a minute, where's the other part? Because every Jew in every synagogue all over the world on Shabbat, they don't read the, just the last part, which is what Yeshua quoted. They read the whole commandment, which is, we do it here every Shabbat. Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. Do you understand? So from a church perspective, you don't even understand that Yeshua was quoting the last part of the most important commandment. And it is important to understand that. I believe that this little Jew inside of you wants to just start coming out and says, you guys need to understand this from a Hebraic perspective. Because you have this DNA thing trying to grow in you. And it keeps getting shut down. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Shema Israel, Adonai Elohim, Adonai Echad. The Lord is one. I remember when Yeshua was saying, Blessed, blessed are the meek, blessed are the poor. Blessed are those who mourn. Remember that. And the, and the multitudes are saying, listen, and just glued to everything he's saying. And at the end of his discourse, he says, Think not that I have come to abolish the law. I have not come to abolish it. I have come to fulfill it. <laughs> I still don't know how shepherds get away with telling the kings and the priests of God that God has done away with it. I still don't know. I'll tell you what it is. It's God's grace. But that grace is going to run out one of these days. Because we are called. We are called to make disciples. Do you know what disciples is? Those who come under the discipline of something. How can you come under discipline of something if there's nothing to be under discipline of? Because you're not under it anymore. If you have children, how can you discipline them if you have no rules, no instructions? Does that even make sense? Can an officer pull you over and give you a ticket if there are no laws of speeding? If there are no laws about stop signs, if there are no laws about when to pass and when to yield, who could give you a ticket? The discipline of what? Go make them disciples. Those who come under the discipline of what? Nothing. Think not that I have come to abolish, but to fulfill it. To fill it completely. And until heaven and earth pass away, not one jot, not one tittle, not the slightest stroke shall be changed from this instruction for a good life. This is where visuals are helpful because, again, from our mind, not a jot or a tittle. Not a jot or a tittle. What's that mean? A jot or a tittle. Not a jot or a tittle. Tittle. <laughs> tittle sounds like a funny word. <laughs> well, I hope he doesn't get rid of the tittles. <laughs> 
do it. Here we go. <laughs> I'm in trouble now. Okay, not one jot or one jot. See, from our mind, what is that? What is, what is that? The slight, not, the, not the slightest stroke. What does that mean? What does that mean? Like visuals, okay? The word, Echad. Echad. Hebrew is read backwards. This is the A sound. This is the H sound, and this is the D sound. Achd, achd, achad. Achad means one. It actually means perfect unity. Achad, achad. You know, squiggly lines, okay? Here is another word. It looks almost identical. Almost identical. If you notice, the only tiny difference is on this letter right here. See the bottom one has a little squiggly line, the top one doesn't? Okay. This top word is echar. Echar. This is an R sound. The dalit and the R look almost identical with the little change of a tiny little pen stroke. Do you see it? Yes. It's almost, it's almost, you almost wouldn't catch it. If you just did this and you did this, you'd think you were looking at the same thing. This is echad, this is echar. The word echad means perfect unity, one. Echar means another. By changing a slight little stroke on God's word, you would change the scripture to read, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is another. Meaning that there are many gods. The Lord our God is just one of many. Do you see? Why until heaven and earth pass away, not the slightest little stroke of a pen can be taken from God's law. And you have shepherds who took the whole thing out? If one little change of a pen can change so much, how much more taking the whole thing and saying, that doesn't apply for us anymore. That's for the Jews, not for us. We're under a new dispensation. <coughs> My God. My God. Have you not heard that it says that in the last days there's going to be a spirit of lawlessness? This? Oh, you thought that meant, oh, people won't be obeying the speed limit? Lawlessness is a spirit that teaches people there is no such thing as God's law. We're under this. And the amazing thing is that people who teach that, they, they set up their own laws. They have to have some laws. So you have, you have a little, you have a few little laws. Can't drink, can't smoke, can't dance, can't wear sexy clothes, depending on where you go, can't wear earrings. If you love the Lord, oh, I, I always love that sign. You know, well, if you really love the Lord, you give up your earrings. What, what a life from the pit of hell. As if God gave a rat's rump about your stupid earrings. <laughs> I mean, we're, we're talking about the one who gave up everything to come and save you. Everything to save you. And last second as he's dying, like, oh, Father, oh, Father, he's dying, all of a sudden he remembers, well, not for her, she's got earrings. Well, who else? Who else here loves me? <laughs> oh, I can't see other than I. They must have punched me in the eye too hard. <laughs> Imagine that. Your shoes on the cross look at us. You got jeans on. You shouldn't have jeans in church. You must not love me. Don't you understand? It's not a matter of if you love the Lord. No. It's the Lord loves me. Don't tell me what I have to do if I love the Lord. My love is worthless. I'm human. My love is flawed. His love is perfect. And in me, his love will far surpass my love. 
to get me to the day where I will wear earrings or not. I will wear a nose bone or not. I will wear whatever he wants me to wear. Because maybe he needs me to, to reach a people who has horns on their heads because they think that that's the way to look. So he's going to have me put horns on my head so that I can walk into that club and look at them and just touch them with the hands of God. I become all things to all so that I can save some. Who said that? A Pharisee said that. A Pharisee that was awakened to the love of God. Paul said that. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees, but he was awakened to the love of God when he fell off his horse and suddenly he felt the light in the presence of God. He says, oh my God, whatever it is you need, I am already dead. I am already dead. Whatever you need. That is the love that Adonai is placing inside of us. That is what he meant when he said, I'm going to engrave my word. Because everything, everything about this word, everything about this word is to awaken to the reality that Adonai is good and there's none good but God. None, not one. <laughs> and so we cry And he says, with men, impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Get out of the way. Watch me come in and take care of it. That is the word that is engraving in our hearts. That's why you can come from a yeshiva class about the festivals. And if the Spirit of God has had His way in you, you will leave this place with no memory. I don't know. There was something about some grass or something. I don't know. I don't know. There was round circles. I don't know. There was numbers. I don't have a clue. But there's something inside of me that I cannot quit. And suddenly you look at the people that you used to think were your enemies. And then this love and this mercy pours out. You know, oftentimes we, we are looking for, for manifestations of God. And they, I, I'm going to tell you right now, they, they're great. It's wonderful. And it happens. It happens. Sometimes you call, for example, for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And everybody knows you got it because you're just freaking out and you're just, it's just, just everybody knows it. You're, you're doing a kiver on the floor, you know. It, it, everybody knows it. You know it. Okay. And that's wonderful. Wonderful. The manifestations of the Spirit of God are wonderful. When, you know, when, when you're sad over there, say, oh, Lord, talk to me. And all of a sudden, a rainbow appears. You know what I'm talking about? And you're, and you're like, oh, my goodness. Oh, my God. 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 Look, look, it's just a rainbow. You know, you call your friends up and they think you're crazy because you think everything God's talking to you, you know. But it's a wonderful thing because you, the manifestations of the Spirit of God are so wonderful. But I'm going to tell you the truth. They're tiny, tiny little crumbs in comparison to the manifestation of God in your heart when you're awakened to this undescribable love first for yourself. And it feels so good to receive this love for yourself. You cannot contain it. It just oozes out of you. And all you have to do is tell him, I'm available to ooze out love. And it's, it's, it's so funny. Just this morning, we're sitting over there at, at McDonald's. You know, three ladies, you know. I am Dad Obama. Obama, I don't think this, this health care is going to be very good. Well, I don't know because I can't afford health care anymore. And Obama's going to be... You know, they go on and you hear it. And there's a reason why God places you in a place to hear it. It's not for you to give your opinion. You're not hearing this information so you can give your opinion. Because instead of giving your opinion, if you're going to give your opinion, you might as well go up to the people and say, look it. Look. I have one. And they look at you like, you're funny. 
You're not there to give your opinion. Oh. <coughs> You're there to manifest the glory of God. So I hear them talking about health care. Walk up. <laughs> Sometimes you have to walk like I don't know. I don't know how he walks. <laughs> but he's, he's walking. <laughs> And I go up to them and I look at them. And it's the Spirit of God speaking to them. And I just put my hands out and I said, The God of heaven bless you with good, long, healthy lives. Bye bye. See ya. Do you get it? That's not an opinion. That is the creative power of God that is as powerful as let there be light. Pick up your bed and walk. Live long and prosper. <laughs> <laughs> Do you understand? And people don't want opinion anyway. People need to hear the voice of the Creator, yes. and He lives in you. The only mouth they're going to hear is what comes out of your mouth. When the Spirit of God in you begins to speak, and to create, and to bless, and to heal. Wow. How are we going to get to the Lamb? <laughs> <laughs> It is, yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, you know, bottom line, bottom line, the top line, side line, every line. <laughs> this is worthless. The moment it clicks into knowledge and information. It was for this whole little seeking of knowledge that we got into this mess in the first place. <laughs> purpose is to awaken in us the awesomeness of God, to see that he has things well in control. Yes. You can't be so angry at him that you can kick him off his throne. I don't care what, if you're upset, some of us have suffered a lot, some of us have lost a lot, and we really struggle with God. Go kick him. Spit at him. Do whatever you want. When you're tired, you'll find him like this. Is get over here, knucklehead. And he takes you in. He says, come, let's reason. Let's reason with one another. Okay. Uh, yes, not one thing from God's instructions can leave. Not one. Not, one. <coughs> not a single one. <coughs> and... An interesting thing about the God we serve is that he says that I will meet you at my appointed times. The children of Israel, they were slaves in Egypt. And you know one of the main reasons why Pharaoh didn't want to let them go? Oh no, they didn't have Martin Luther's Day. Mm -mm. They didn't have Veterans Day. They didn't have Valentine's Day. They didn't even have Thanksgiving Day. Okay? Because if they would have, or had Christmas, or, or all these little holidays with no Jew, Pharaoh would have been okay with that. Go, go ahead, have your little... D d oh no, when you serve the king of the universe, oh man, he hooks you up with more holidays that you're doing more partying and celebrating to other night than you are working. That will not work for a Pharaoh who needs to build kingdoms. How can these people, these people, okay, every week they have to have one day off, Shabbat, okay? Then all of a sudden, there's this whole thing, Passover coming in, and then there's seven days after that straight, and then all of a sudden they have to count uh, uh, seven weeks until they have to celebrate another one, and meanwhile they're doing 
every every week. And then, plus they have the new moon celebrations. What the heck? You gotta keep, well, when is the new moon? Well, you gotta keep an eye on the moon. And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden there's, there's a signing of the shofar, and they can't work on that because they're listening to the shofar. And all of a sudden there's a day of atonement, that's 10 days later, but between this day and that day, there's, there's also a, a new moon, and there's also, a, what the heck? Get the heck out of here! I don't think you're gonna go out there. There's no way I can run my kingdom with you people taking all these days off. <laughs> this was the problem. This was the problem. And if you happen to work for a boss and suddenly an eye awakens you to the fact and says, listen, you want to see how tough it is? <laughs> you want to see how tough it is to really serve an eye on his appointed times? Just go to your boss one of these days and says, you know what? I have awakened to my Hebraic <laughs> thing. Can't explain it. But basically, I'm going to ask you to just give me the Hebrew festivals off. He'll uh, say, okay. What, the, what is it? Oh, you know, we got Shabbat and we got the Rosh Hashanah. We got Yom Kippur. Sukkot. That's eight days. <laughs> and then we have, and then we have, we have Hanukkah. Can't forget Hanukkah, that's another eight days. <laughs> there aren't enough vacation days for you to take all the festivals of Adonai. They just aren't. Your boss will look at you and say, have you considered getting another job, like maybe being a rabbi of a Jewish congregation? Because that's the only kind of job you're going to have where you can actually take all the festivals. Of course, as a rabbi, that's when you actually have to work. So that's sort of a little crazy kind of thing. But I'll tell you, this is the problem that the people of Israel had. And this is why Pharaoh would not let them go. Because Adonai says, I want them to come out to the wilderness so that they can worship me on my appointed times. And Pharaoh's like, at one point Pharaoh says, you go ahead and then come back. And he says, yes, we're going to go, but we're going to go and worship Adonai on his appointed times. Well, that didn't work. That didn't work. And so Adonai needed to show a strong hand for the people of Israel. And this is where we begin on the first festival of God's calendar. We all know the story that these people for many, many years, many generations were stuck as, as slaves in Egypt. And in one day, in one day, our dad set them all free. And not one hoof was left behind. Not only that, as they were leaving and taking their sweet time, <laughs> the Egyptians gave them gold and silver and diamonds and jewels. I don't understand why we're doing it, but there's something I don't know. We got <laughs> That's the God we serve. And every day of our lives, we have situations where we're in the exact same situation. There is a Pharaoh pointing at you and saying, there's no way you're going to be allowed to do this. And at a certain point, Adonai will set you free. And you walk away. And I'm sure some people were saying, because right, there's always the doubters in the crowd, well, how are we going to survive in the wilderness? We don't have uh, money. We don't have... <coughs> Here comes the gold. I don't know what for, because there weren't any stores in the wilderness, or you know. But you have gold, you know. It's like that, and I said, "All right, fine. There you go. I have some gold. <laughs> Maybe that'll help you, you know, be excited, you know." So anyway, um, this takes place, and um, if you read the scripture, some of you have heard me say this. You read in the scripture, and every once in a while, especially in the Old Testament, you'll say, "And on the first month, and on the third day of the fourth month," you know. You read that. And because we don't have a Hebraic mindset, we usually read that and skip right over it because what the heck do we care about the month? So God is doing something in January or February. I don't know, and I don't really care. 
Well, Adonai wants us to understand that in the scriptures, when he's talking about another birth month, second month, third month, and so forth, he's talking about his calendar, not the Roman calendar. See, the Romans worshipped the sun, so they established their calendar based on the sun. Adonai taught us to establish the calendar based on the lunar cycle, from new moon to new moon. And there's a reason why he did that, because the sun has the light, but the moon has no light of itself. It simply is a witness that the sun exists in the middle of darkness. God's way of saying, even when things get dark, look up into the heavens, and I'm going to show you there is a witness in the heavens that there is light on the other side. So don't despair. That's the God we serve. He's always encouraging us when we're, when we're scared. or Because imagine not understanding why did all of a sudden everything, got, everything was beautiful and all of a sudden everything got dark. And all of a sudden there's a, a sliver in the heavens. And I say, look at that. That's my calendar. And I'm going to remind you of my calendar when the times are dark. When it's daylight, you're probably not even going to think about my calendar because you can't even really hardly see the moon. But it's when times are dark that I'm going to remind you of my calendar. Isn't it amazing that we are entering into some serious dark times? And here is a group of God's kids saying, I think, I don't know why, but I think I need to be here for some reason. It's so that Adonai can restore his calendar back to your spirit. So you can understand that when times are dark, there's a witness in the heavens that there's light shining on the other side. And so the nice calendar is really very simple. Um, when you see a sliver on the right-hand side, see the slivers on the right-hand side? Okay, that's the rising of the month. And, the, and then, so this is about one week. This is two weeks, full moon. Right in the middle of the month. So full moon is like 14th, 15th day. Okay? Then all of a sudden there's a backwards D. That's three weeks. About a week later there's a little sliver and then the moon disappears. It's a new moon again. Yesterday we just celebrated Rosh Kodesh, a new moon. So yesterday, actually today, you go out there, you, you, you probably will not see anything. But tomorrow, if this, the heavens are clear, you look up and this is what you're going to see in the heavens a little sliver on the right hand side of the moon. It doesn't matter where on planet Earth you are, tomorrow evening, this is what all of the inhabitants of the Earth will see. And it marks the first day, or actually by now it would be the second day of God's um, month. It's so simple. Children understand it. So simple. Without understanding God's simple lunar calendar it is impossible, impossible to figure out when to meet at his appointed times. So when he says on the, fourth, on, on, the, on, the, on the 14th day of the first month, if you don't know God's lunar calendar, how would you know the 14th day of what? January? That makes sense? And a nice restoring back to our spirit, the understanding of his time. This is so important that the book of Daniel says in the last days, the enemy, the anti-Messiah spirit, the anti-Messiah spirit is going to do everything he can to change God's calendars and God's seasons. Why? Because God knows if his people don't know his seasons and his cycles, how are they going to meet at his appointed time so that they can get refreshed by God. Imagine, it's as if God had this faucet of refreshing. And he says, I'm going to open it on the 14th day of the first month. I'm going to open it on, on the you know, third day of whatever month. Like he actually gives us a schedule, right? And we're thirsty. And someone says, no, put that away. We're not under that nonsense anymore. You're thirsty. And you go to the fountain and you're like, oh man, it's a fountain, but nothing comes out of it. Oh well, maybe God's all done sending refreshing water. No, he's not done. You're just there on the wrong day. Any 
Anybody here farm? Anybody ever plant anything in the ground? Does it work? Does it actually work? It does? I mean, I've been planting in the winter. What's wrong? I faithfully plant in the winter. It doesn't work for me. It's a dis dispensation I don't belong to, I guess. No, it's not a dispensation. Idiot, you're doing it on the guitar wrong time. I, I was calling myself an idiot. <laughs> Actually, I think an idiot is someone who has a lot of ideas. <laughs> <laughs> da Vinci was an idiot. <laughs> All right, okay. So here we go. God's calendar. So, so this basically gives us the, the month. Okay, God's calendar is very simple. It's just four weeks. Four weeks in a day, four weeks less a day. It's always the same thing. Very, very simple. Okay? And Adonai says, okay, so from new moon to new moon, that's a month. Okay? Now we need a starting point because there are several new moons throughout the year. We need a starting point. The starting point is spring, in particular, when barley is ready to be harvested. Okay? In, in Israel. For us in the United States, that's when you begin to see the green buds shooting out of trees. Exactly the same time. In between the moon cycle, when you begin to see the little buds come up, that's month number one. It's that simple. No matter where you are on earth, you would know exactly, and then you could start counting and you know exactly when the nice festivals are. So you can meet them at his appointed times. So we're in the seventh month right now? We just enter the eighth. Eight. Mm -hmm. We just enter the eighth month. Okay? Pretty simple. From new moon to new moon, that's a month. And whenever uh, spring begins in any one of these new moon cycles, that's month number one. It's so simple. The children of Israel would understand it this way. If, if spring wouldn't come for another 20 years, we'd have like 500 months. They just keep counting the moons. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 20, 50, 70, 80, 90,000. It happens to be 12 new moons a year. Every once in a while, they have to recalibrate because what happens is uh, spring starts here one year, the next year starts here on the month, starts here, and then starts here. It moves. God always, always causes it to move because He never wants us to get settled with comfort. Okay, I gotta figure it out. Oh no, you better pay attention because the minute you sit down and think you figured it out, you'll lose track. He's constantly saying, "Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on." Just like a dad or a mom does when you have that little one who just learned how to take a step, you know? And they're like, you know? And they're getting close to you and you're going, you're going like, oh my God, oh my God. Because you're, you're drawing them closer to teach them to walk, to teach them to run. This is what God does with us. Okay? So anyway, um, let's grab a hold of this. Let me take a quick look at... I mean, I mean, a whole different dimension, a dimension where there is no time. Oh, Ruth Hashem, we got plenty of time. Uh, and I, by the way, my goal is, is sort of try to sort of wrap up these yeshiva classes by 8.30, 9 o'clock. I'd like to wrap them up by, by 8.30, hopefully. That way, between 8.30 and 9 o'clock, if people have a few questions or whatever, I can say, I don't have a spider side yet. And anyway, we can just go home. <laughs> But, uh, but anyway, that's, that's the goal anyway. Okay, so we're going to take care of Passover. We're pretty familiar with Passover. This is when the children of Israel in Egypt, and Adonai took them out of Egypt. Now, here's where we have to go into Scripture and understand. Uh, uh, Leviticus 23, someone has a Scripture, just sort of open it up, just really briefly to read the appointed festivals of the Lord. Leviticus, I think it's Leviticus 23. Is it? Okay. Yes, nice and loud. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, The feast of the Lord which you shall proclaim to the holy convocations, these are my feasts. Okay, that's really important. Because as a missionary rabbi, I often get accused of trying to do the Jewish feast. These are not the Jewish feasts. These are the Lord's feasts. That's important to understand. Okay, continue. Six days you shall work. Six days work shall be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of solemn rest, a holy congregation. You should do no work on it. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. 
continue. These are the feasts of the Lord, holy congregations, which you shall proclaim at your appointed times. On the fourteenth day of the first month at twilight is the Lord's Passover. Okay, stop right there. That's where we're going to go. See, here you go. On the fourteenth day of the first month, you read that. What the heck does that mean? January? No. From what I explained, the first month happens in spring. So it's between the, the new moon and the next new moon when the spring begins. That help you understand? So when the buds come out, between the new moon and the next new moon, it's, it's uh, four weeks, and that's the first month. So you begin to count, okay? So let's look over here. I actually put numbers down over here. The month is a little longer than that. But just for the sake of sort of counting what Adonai just said, let's say that this is the first moon cycle. Uh, uh, the, 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 there's little shoots coming out somewhere over here in the month. So we know this is the first month. And Adonai says, on the twilight of the... Lord, on the twilight of the... On the 14th day of the first month at twilight, at twilight. is the Lord's Passover. Okay, beautiful. So here we go. Um, it's twilight evening or morning. Okay, twilight Twilight is... is um, um, okay, um, it, it's like at the at, just before sunset on the 14th. Twilight is just before sunset. Okay? So anyway... So if this is the first month, okay, in God's calendar, he's saying on the 14th, on the twilight of the 14th, which is right here, you're going to be celebrating Passover, okay? So I'm going to put a little mark over here so that we know this is when we're going to celebrate. How neat is this? Do you realize that no matter where you are on earth, if all you knew was that every year when spring happens, you would start counting. As soon as you see the no moon, you start counting. Day 1, day 2, day 3, day 14, and you celebrate Passover with your friends. And you'll be doing it at the same exact time as all of the people of God who have returned back to His instructions all over the world. You'll be doing it at exactly the same time. How neat is that? You don't even need to call someone. Just look up into the heavens and you would know. What's that? That's right. Even if you're all alone in an island somewhere. How awesome is that? Okay, so then I said, on the 14th day, you're going to celebrate uh, uh, the Passover. Okay. Um, I'm going to show you how amazingly accurate Adonai's ways are. Because we're familiar with the Passover from a Christian standpoint. What happened on Passover from, from a Christian mindset? Yeshua got crucified. Yeshua got crucified. Right? It, it, from a Christian perspective, we know Passover to be, you know, Jesus got crucified on Passover. And it, wow, that was an interesting coincidence. <laughs> Not. <laughs> God's amazing calendar working perfectly. Okay? Now, um, let's, let's go to the accounts that happened um, on, on the Passover that we sort of understand. Okay? Let us go to da, 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 uh, John... 12, verse 1. These, this is a few days before Passover. Uh, the Apostle John is actually speaking about some of the events that took place before Passover. Okay? Now we know this is month number one. We know Passover is to be celebrated on the, on the uh, evening of the 14th. Okay? So now we can start using this to, to get our bearings using the New Testament. Then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus was. So okay. Six days before. Six days before Passover. Baruch Hashem. Baruch Hashem. Okay. Two, three, four, five, six. Six days before Passover. Okay. This is important to understand. Okay. Because if you just read on the first month and six days before Passover, and you have no perception as to where that is on God's calendar, that's aimless information. It means absolutely nothing. But tonight, we're going to pin these dates down and these times down to see what God is doing in His amazing calendar. Okay? So Passover is here, and John, was just, we just read that six days before Passover, Yeshua was in Bethany doing something. Okay? So that's right about here. Okay? 
Um, we're going to jump a little bit ahead because we don't have time to read the whole verse, okay? Uh, but uh, do, 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 do. Um, actually, you know, uh, read all the way up to to, uh, to verse 13, beginning with verse 1 again. Okay. Then six days before Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus was, who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. There they made him supper, and Martha served. But Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spike knives, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, Why was this fragrance, fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Then he said, This he said not because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and he had the money box. And he used it to, to, he, he used to take what was put in it. But Jesus said, Let her alone. She has kept for this day, she has kept this for the day of my burial. For the poor you have with you always, but me you do not have always. Now a great many of the Jews knew that was, he was there, and they came for Jesus' sake, but they also might that they might, might also see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests <coughs> fought with Lazarus to death also, because on account of him, many Jews went away and believed in Jesus. The next day stop. Okay. Six days before Passover. Wah, 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 wah. The next day. Where is that? Here? Okay. Now see, here's what happens. We read that story. What are we going to focus on? Well, we're going to focus on the beautiful things about this prostitute, right? Uh, washing his feet. We're so focused on the fruit the sweet awesomeness of the things that God is doing, it's so difficult to focus on something that seems completely like nonsense. Uh, first month, uh, six days before, the next day, who cares? I just want to see what Jesus is doing. But Anai says, you've seen what he's doing. Now go back and see when he did it. So yeah, I can reveal a little bit more of what I am doing. And once you understand what I am doing, you'll understand what you're doing. So right here, the next day, the next day a great multitude that came to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Okay, stop right there. Um, those of you who celebrate a Sukkot this year, do you remember waving? Why are these people doing that here? This is happening in the first month. Sukkot is celebrated on the seventh month. Do you know why they're doing it? They're a little confused. They know that the king is coming on Sukkot. So when they realize that Yeshua is the king, they're like, well, we don't really know how this is happening, but we might go get Paul and wave it, because we've got to wave that for the entrance of the king. But there's a little problem, because part of the wave offering is choice fruits that came from the land. Well, those are not going to come until the autumn. So the only thing they can wave is Paul, because that's the only thing they have because the earth hasn't produced fruit yet. You'll get this. But he is the fruit, that's right. Because what's happening is he's coming in as a king, but it's out of season. Okay. But he comes in as a king. And we're going to put a little <coughs> crown right there on the tenth day. Have you ever read this story? and said to yourself, what the hell's the matter with these damn Jews? How the heck do, could they accept him here? 10 days. And like a few days later, kill him. What were they on, some kind of crazy poppy drug or something? What were they, they're smoking something. Who can do that? Well, there's a reason why this happened. Because his ways are higher than our ways. 
Okay? For that, we have to go into the Old Testament. Exodus 12, verse 3. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, every man shall take for himself a land, according to the house of his father. Okay, stop right there. On the what? The tenth On the tenth? Oh, okay. Uh, this line below, with blue, represents Old Testament. That old thing that we flushed down the toilet. The above represents what's happening in the New Testament. And let's see how inaccurate the Old Testament is in comparison to the New. Or not. I want you to read it again. I get so excited I just stop it. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, every man shall take for himself a land according to the house of his father, a land for a household. Okay. Do you understand that precisely on time, at the same time that Shua is coming into Jerusalem is the same time that the Lord spoke to the children of Israel 10 days before before Passover you have to take a little lamb into your home and the purpose of this was this you were supposed to take it in and treat it like a pet you were supposed to take care of it this is why when Yeshua came into Jerusalem he was received they were keeping God's perfect commands completely without any understanding of what they were doing because his ways are not our ways the children of Israel at the exact same moment in God's circles of time, at the same exact moment that they were bringing a little lamb to take care of him in the house, was the same exact moment that Yeshua walks in on a, on a donkey's fall into Jerusalem. God's calendar working perfectly. Okay? Um, John 18. Uh, actually, you know what? We don't, need, we don't even uh, need to go there. We know pretty much the account that happens. You know that Yeshua is, um, because, it, because of the, the lack of time we have, there are certain things that we already know. We know that Yeshua was crucified when? On Passover. Everybody agrees with that. Okay, so we don't need to go through the scripture to, to figure that out because that's something that as believers we should all know. Okay? So here it is. One, two, three, four days before... Four days before the king is slain, he's received into Jerusalem, okay? Now there's a little problem because he is a king, he's also a priest, but there is a little problem, is that there is another, another priesthood established by God on earth. There was two priesthoods on earth when Yeshua was on earth. One was the fact that Yohanan, John the Baptist, was the son of Zacharias. John the Baptist was supposed to be the next high priest, anointed high priest. He was not received by the Sanhedrin, so they had placed another man, which was Caiaphas, as high priest. So there was a, 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 a political high priest and a spiritual high priest, both of which must be <coughs> demoted so that Yeshua can become the high priest above all. And what happens to John the Baptist? He says to his disciples, he says, I must decrease so that he may increase. And then what happens to John the Baptist? Loses his head. Boom, he's demoted. So now there's only one high priest. Now, now there's Yeshua, and then there is Caiaphas, who is a political high priest. And God is so awesome because God will honor even the political high priest because God is, doesn't say, well, you know, I, don't, I disagree, so I decide differently. God honors because God is the one who placed them there as high priest. We know the story. For lack of time, I'm not, we're not going to read it. But Yeshua comes on Passover, on Passover, and he brings them before Caiaphas. And they were looking for people who would accuse them, and they couldn't find anybody. And finally, a couple guys stood up and said, this guy said that he's going to destroy the temple, and in three days he's going to rebuild it or something like that. And then Caiaphas looks at him and he says, tell us, I, I, I command you, by the word of the Lord, tell us for sure, are you the anointed one, son of God? And you know, the great line, Yeshua stands up and says, I am. It's as you say, and you shall see me. 
Sit down at the right hand of the power of God. Okay, you know, Yeshua could have, you know, you, you could have stopped that, yes. <laughs> but he had to dig deeper. Why did he have to dig deeper? Because immediately after this, Caiaphas hears this and he says, I've heard enough. And Caiaphas takes his robes and rips them. I don't know if I have the scripture. I do. Leviticus 21.10. Leviticus 21.10. He was the high priest among the brethren on whose head the anointing oil was poured and who was consecrated to wear the garments shall not uncover his head nor tear his clothes, nor shall he go near any dead body or defile himself for his father or his mother. Okay. Caiaphas demoted himself when he ripped his clothes. High priests cannot tear their clothes. Actually, you know, uh, people who come from the Catholic background, the, 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 the little collar, the priestly collar, you know where that comes from? That comes from Torah, where it says that you, you, you have this garment where you cannot tear at your collar, you know, so, so people just create this little thing. But it's actually the high priest who could not tear their robes. And when Caiaphas did that, he demoted himself. So now the political high priest is gone, the spiritual high priest is gone, and the spiritual high priest has to impart onto the next high priest the honor and the glory. And that gets done when Yeshua comes to get mikvah. And Yohanan looks at him and says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And he says, I am not worthy to make for you. You should be doing it to me. And Yeshua says, Well, you must do this because it is for them that I sanctify myself. Why? Because on that moment you were being sanctified with Yeshua in Him before the foundation of the world. So that you could be sanctified. Why did He have to be sanctified when He was perfect? Well, He became our curse. So with our curse, He had to be cleansed from our curse. Because He took on all of our sins upon Himself. That's why He had to go mikvah, be baptized, and to be cleansed. For our sake, not for His. Okay? So, that takes place. Um, okay. Uh, Matthew 27, verse 22. I've got a little problem. we got a little problem. There are no more high priests except for Yeshua. <laughs> we need a sacrifice. We need someone to wash because part of the sacrificial plan, someone in Torah has to wash before they do the sacrifice. And you have to check the lamb to see if the lamb has any blemish. Someone has to inspect the sacrifice. And if there's any blemish on the sacrifice, the sacrifice is not accepted. Pilate said to them, What shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? They all said to him, Let him be crucified. Then the governor said, Why? What evil has he done? But they cried out all the more, saying, Let him be crucified. Let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could not prevail over all, but rather that a helmet was rising, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. You see to it. Of course. Wow. Of course he's innocent of it. This is why he has to wash his hands. You know why he's innocent of it? Because he's not Hebrew. It is the children of Israel that are responsible for killing the lamb. Huh? I want you to read um, okay. Exodus 12, verse 6. We're continuing from the instruction. Bring the lamb in the house. Now you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. Stop. Wow. <laughs> On the fourteenth day, who who's God commanding to kill the lamb? All, all, oh. all of Israel. Hmm. Does it say the Gentiles are commanded to do this thing? No. Read it again. Now you shall keep the lamb to the fourteenth day of the same month, then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. Now you understand 
Why, when Pilate said, I see no blemish in him, what should I do with him? And the people of Israel, in one accord, shouted, crucify him. Crucify him. All this time, we're blaming people for what they've done, though they're doing it perfectly in God's calendar. Perfectly, according, who instructed the people of Israel to kill the Lamb? God! What were they doing 2,000 years ago, exactly on the 14th day of the first month? Killing Him! We serve a God that is so amazing that He'll take you on your worst day when you think in your hate God and He'll manifest His glory in your worst day. He'll take your hate against Him and be glorified from it. And in the end, He'll turn around and pour something over you and bless you anyway because you didn't even know you were blessing God in your own anger and frustration. Exodus 12, verse 7. And they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the house where they eat. And they shall eat the flesh on that night, roasted in fire with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs. They shall eat it. Do not eat it raw, nor boil it at all with water, but roast it in fire. Okay, stop. Okay. Begin again. And they shall do what? And they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel. Okay, the that's enough. They're going to take the blood and put it on the doorposts. Okay, Matthew 27, verse 24 through 25. Verse 24, when Pilate saw that he could not prevail, but rather it was a tumult was rising, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person, you see to it. And all the people answered and said, His blood be on us, not our children. <laughs> 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 that ought to make somebody want to scream. Do you realize that precisely on the night's calendar, the children of Israel are keeping the law by killing the lamb. And when he says, what am I going to do with the blood? Put it on us. Put it on us and our descendants. And God in heaven is dancing. Yeah, I suckered you into the kingdom. I kept you obedient to my laws. This is the God we serve. This is the God we serve. This is why it says somewhere, and then all of Israel shall be saved. Do you understand? And so this gospel has to be spoken to all the nations and to all the Gentiles until the fullness of the Gentiles is awakened to the truth of the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. And then God will take away the veil from their eyes. And they're going to look upon him whom they have pierced. And they will mourn as a mother mourns for an only child. Now when will they look upon him whom they pierced? When is he coming? We will get to that. We get a little advanced. When is Yeshua coming? Sukkot. Feast of Tabernacles. You look at this. This is the warning. This is the day of atonement when you weep. And then they shall weep. <laughs> and then they shall weep. You see that? They can't weep here. There is no weeping going on for Passover. Passover is a time where you don't understand what's happening. There is no commandment to weep for Passover. This is why our people seem to be so stiff-necked. And they'll call you a Jesus lover. And they'll call you a stick boy lover. And they'll be... You, you want to be tested to see how well you're going to leave the children of Israel? It's easy to love me. It's easy to love other Jews who are so nice. And I'll bring a shout and I bless you. You run into one of my brothers who looks at you in the eye and you're looking like you're talking to a demon. Suddenly you, 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 you rethink. Do I really want to leave? Love these Jews? Man, they're just stiff night. Oh, yes. Because God pick the nation who would be the worst, most stiff-necked nation so that he could prove his love for all. So that all nations will say, if God had mercy for Israel, truly he will have mercy for the Chippewa, for the Pawnee, for, for the Cherokee, for the French, 
for the English, for everybody. Because he's a merciful God. And it says that all the nations will come and celebrate the feast of the Lord in Israel. To celebrate the God who created the heavens and the earth. How awesome is that? So here we are, learning about it and preparing for a kingdom in which this will be like kindergarten stuff. The children will understand this. You know, the story sort of continues. Because this high priest and king is crowned. And is beaten. And we just learned that if his garments got torn, he gets demoted. And now he's hanging on a cross, unable to move his hands. And there are evil men holding on to a garment. And Hasatan is saying, Did you realize that if these evil men so much as rip this garment that was placed on his back, that he'll get demoted on the cross? And Satan is like, rip it! Rip it! And these evil men are like, rip it? Ah, oh, no, I gotta get the whole thing. Because greed set in. I don't want half of the garment. I want all of it. And there was like, no! No, greed is not good today. Greed is bad. No greed. Rip it. Share it. Share it. Oh, no. I want the whole thing. Ah. Do you understand? Demons are freaking out and the angels are dancing. Because that which the enemy intends for evil, our Father turns to good. You realize that Hasatan prepared these men to be greedy and to learn how to gamble. And all of a sudden, Hasatan is saying, no, no gambling, just rip it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you prepare them perfectly. And these guys, how awesome would it be for you to walk into the gates of hell and say, we are the guys. <laughs> <laughs> that kept Yeshua from being demoted. We gotta get him into the kingdom. We gotta get him in! You can grab us and say, guys, that was great! That was great, your greed worked perfectly. Because <laughs> you kept the king as a king. On the one day, you could have shared the garment and have demoted him. See, the problem is, we are so Christianized in our thinking that we think that God will be like, well, well, no, I don't need that. <laughs> oh, everything about God is accurate. Accurate. Nothing happens by accident. Nothing. If someone would have ripped that garment, the show would have been demoted. You would not have a priest that intercedes on your behalf right now. This is why he said, until heaven and earth pass away, not the slightest job or tittle shall pass from my word. Father, we thank you. Bless you. Father, if, if you do these things in such an amazing way through, through Messiah and through your people, taking everything that the enemy intended for evil and turning it to good, what are you doing in our lives? Because you're up to something, Father. You are up to something. And we're looking forward to understanding what it is. Because this same king that was never demoted but hung on a cross on our behalf, now in tabernacles, in the center of our heart, preparing this house, because in the Father's house there are many rooms, until the whole earth is filled with your glory. And you are preparing for yourself a lamb, a many-membered lamb, for we all like lambs are led to the slaughter. <laughs> <laughs> but we are convinced that neither hell nor heaven, nor things above nor things below, 
There are things past or things to come. We'll ever be able to separate us from the love that we have been given through Messiah, through whom we can cry out, Dad, <laughs> Dad. And we're no longer humans on earth looking for a God, but we are children, children of God. We love you, Father. Father, we pray, Father God, that you, that you will just manifest, Father, the awesomeness of, of these revelations in our heart, Father, as we go forth, Father, mm -hmm. to proclaim your goodness, not to speak about God, but to manifest mm -hmm. God. It's a big difference. We were not created to talk about God. We were created to manifest our dad. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. You're so awesome, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you so much, Father. Thank you so much for preparing everything perfectly. Because if Yeshua would have died on the wrong day, his sacrifice would have not been valid. Thank you, Father. You are perfect. Truly, Father, you alone. Father, right now we just repent for our former understanding mm -hmm. of these things. Father, we repent, Father, for, for having believed that you're all done with your word and all we have to do is hold on to Messiah. Father, we thank you so much for what Messiah has done for us, but he did this for us so that we could grow into him. Not hold on to him at the foot of a cross somewhere. He's not there. He's not there. He's not there. He's not hanging on a cross. And he's not in a manger either. <laughs> he's not there. He's in you, preparing you to say, Father, these hands are your hands. His eyes are your eyes. His heart is your heart. His feet are your feet. It is no longer I that live, but the anointed one of Israel who lives in me. For me to live is the anointed one. For me to die is gain. I am seated with him in heavenly places. He dwells with me on earthly realms. I am no longer a sinner saved by grace. I was a sinner saved by grace. It is no longer I that live, but the King who lives in me.